Hello, and welcome to Module 2 for the residency course, Management of Head, Neck, and Upper Thoracic Conditions. This module we will primarily cover the treatment-based classification system for patients with neck disorders. We will discuss the development of this classification system, uh, how it's progressed over the years, and how to best apply this to uh, the patients that you see in front of you every day. So the pathoanatomic model. This is the model in which signs and symptoms are analyzed, some sort of pathology is determined, treatment corresponds to addressing said pathology, signs and symptoms disappear, patient gets better. However, as we know, this is not necessarily effective in spinal conditions. We often cannot determine a specific anatomical source of symptoms. Pathology seen on imaging is oftentimes not related to pain or disability levels. And in general, this model has led to a whole lot of unnecessary costs, particularly in terms of imaging uh, and even surgery. The treatment-based classification concept is to use information from the history and physical examination to categorize patients according to which treatment approach they're likely to benefit from, rather than from which pathoanatomical concept we believe is directly causing their symptoms. It's a little bit different approach than what is typically taught, particularly uh, in the medical community. So within the treatment-based classification system, our first decision is always, does this patient belong in PT or not? And essentially the concept is, does this patient need PT only? Should they be referred out? Or maybe is it some sort of combination? And we consider this with red and yellow flags. So is it a yellow flag? Is it a caution? Do we need to maybe think about additional practitioners? Or is it a red flag? Are they sent off the PT field and need to go elsewhere? Red flags to consider in particular with cervical, with cervical or neck pain pathologies are things like cervical myelopathy, cancer, upper cervical instability, vertebral artery issues, and maybe some sort of s inflammatory or systemic disease. Here is a list of the common signs and symptoms to be looking for. And I will argue, again, these are not necessarily contraindications to physical therapy, but maybe indications that we need to refer these patients to an additional provider particularly in, in terms of neoplastic conditions, uh, cancer, or the inflammatory processes. Upper ligamentous instability uh, should also be referred out, um, particularly if it's an acute onset, such as following trauma. Cervical myelopathy, uh, I believe, can be treated by physical therapy. However, uh, may also require additional uh, management, particularly as the condition progresses, especially if you're seeing signs of bowel and bladder dysfunction, uh, or if these signs are, as I said, particularly progressive, uh, these may indicate that surgical management is required. Retrieval artery insufficiency is a very controversial topic, and we will discuss this uh, later in the course. Yellow flags. These are things to consider. They will particularly uh, implicate, have significant implications as far as prognosis is concerned. And again, do we need to refer these patients to additional services? Oftentimes, uh, I'm considering with yellow flags, does this person require some sort of 
uh, psychological or counseling intervention in addition to uh, physical therapy management. These are oftentimes uh, looking at concepts regarding fear avoidance uh, as well as depression. Also looking at um, the other risk factors that we know uh, are related to a poor prognosis. For example, smoking, uh, high substance abuse, whether that's alcohol, illicit drugs, or prescribed drugs, um, extended bed rest, these things like, uh, are oftentimes factors that are modifiable. So after we've gone through this process and we figure out that they belong in physical therapy, now what do we do with them? There are several treat, uh, diagnostic processes out there. Uh, if we list these by the gurus, we have McKenzie, we have Saruman, we have uh, Wong, Paris, Maitland, the osteopathic model. Uh, some of you may be in, a, exposed to the ICD classification process, we have a treatment classification. How do we best decide which model to use and how do we apply this to our patient? This can lead us to tearing our hair out. So let's see what the evidence may suggest and what our experience suggests. So in my training, I did my manual therapy training through the University of St. Augustine. Uh, and so here's a classification uh, described by Dr. Stanley Paris. Uh, general concepts is that he accepts that most spinal structures are innovated and therefore can be pain generators. He tries to identify a syndrome from the examinations of signs and symptoms. As a manual therapist, you certainly will manipulate joints to free restriction, manipulate muscles to lengthen tight tissues, instruct the patient in their responsibility to avoid injury and self-care, and his idea is to treat the cause of the pain, not the pain itself. I believe all of this is well and good, except for the last statement. Uh, as many of you have probably experienced, sometimes the pain itself is actually a problem and treating the cause of pain can be rather difficult. And certainly modern neuroscience would suggest that sometimes we in fact do need to address the pain itself or at least the pain behaviors. Paris has these different classifications uh, that you can see on the screen. Uh, in studying for my manual therapy test, I often found that these different classifications led to similar treatment principles. Uh, for example, facet dysfunction would be uh, manipulated. Um, a positional fault would be manipulated. Um, oftentimes we might manipulate individuals with headaches or entrapment neuropathies. Um, or lateral foraminal stenosis. Uh, it became very difficult for me to keep all these together. Uh, I'm apparently just not as bright as Dr. Paris is. Uh, I found many of my students to also have difficulty with this, so I started looking for other classifications. Um, also, with all due respect to Dr. Paris, there is no direct evidence to suggest that this particular classification improves outcomes. So, in looking at evidence, here is a trial uh, by Wong et al. published in 2003 looking at using a clinical decision-making algorithm uh, to improve outcomes in, for patients with neck pain. This is a, quote, quasi-experimental, non-equivalent, pre-test, post-test control group design. So, there may be some issues. Essentially, there was a treatment group and a control group, which was essentially patients who were placed on a wait list. A single physical therapist with 24 years of experience advanced and advanced manual therapy training provided treatment. 
So if we look at external validity, um, if you are a extensively trained manual therapist with 24 years of experience, this uh, study may apply to you. For the rest of us, we may need to look else. This, this decision-making process may not be so applicable. Here is the treatment algorithm. You can see on this page uh, there are a total of 14 patterns and this actually doesn't include all of the patterns. In general they looked at four main classifications that was neck pain only, headaches, referred arm and neck pain, and radicular arm and neck pain. Now again, here are 14 plus uh, different patterns, and I'm not sure that all of us are going to be able to keep all of this straight. And again, uh, oftentimes there's a, a large overlap between interventions that are applied to each different pattern. Here are the outcomes. So the treatment group generally did better as far as improved range of motion, decreased pain, Uh, and improved strength. However, again, this was a group that got treated versus a group that didn't get treated. So the good news is, is that something is better than nothing. So still, this is some evidence to suggest that classifying our patients improves outcomes, but it's not very strong. So in 2004, There was a proposal of a treatment-based classification, uh, and this was, this was developed incorporating the best evidence available at the time. Here they came up with five categories. Mobility, centralization, pain control, reduced headache, conditioning, and, and increased exercise tolerance, and pain control. Uh, at this point, I felt much happier. I felt I could keep track of five different categories. Explicit in this treatment-based classification is that the patient may start with one classification and move from another. The names of these classifications are related to what your primary intention of treatment is at the time. So the mobility classification, you're trying to improve mobility and range of motion. Uh, in centralization, you're trying to uh, centralize and reduce someone's uh, preferred or ridiculous symptoms, reduce headache, well that's obvious, let's make their headache better, conditioning and increase exercise tolerance, uh, this is basically improving cervical spine strength and endurance, uh, in some ways similar to the stabilization category from the lumbar spine classification system. The pain control classification uh, was sort of related to that person who comes in and you can barely touch and what is recommended to uh, get these patients under control so that we can then move them into a different classification. Some of these same researchers in 2008 uh, published uh, clinical guidelines uh, and they linked these to the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health. Uh, so this is essentially the uh, orthopedic section of the American Physical Therapy Association's uh, recommendation for treatment of neck pain. Uh, they used concepts from the uh, previously published treatment-based classification system, uh, but then expanded on them based on uh, new evidence. As we'll present these, uh, it may be interesting to look at what was, how did things progress from 2004 to 2008. In these ortho section guidelines, they now have four classifications. Again, my simple mind was much happier because now I only have to remember four things instead of five, which is a whole lot better than 14. We have neck pain with mobility deficits, neck pain with headache, neck pain with movement co and coordination impairments. Notice how this sounds a little bit different than the increased exercise tolerance from the previous classification. And then we have neck pain with radiating pain. 
they eliminated the pain control classification uh, because oftentimes with pain control we may be trying to do some range of motion activities or some mobilization activities that could help control their symptoms. So if we look at the mobility classification from the originally described treatment-based classification system from 2004, we see there's examination findings. Generally, these patients might have increased onset. They might not have ridiculous symptoms radiating into the upper extremity. Restri generally, they'll show restricted range of motion. They lack mobility. No signs of nerve root compression or peripheralization. Uh, there's some uh, and then they may show segmental hypomobility or soft tissue restriction. Please note in the next few slides, the uh, lettering in white is directly from the published treatment-based classification system, and the lettering that is in yellow is uh, either from additional evidence that came, that has been published since 2004 or based on my own clinical experience. So the interventions for individuals in the mobility classification system described in 2004 were cervical and thoracic mobilization and or manipulation and range of motion exercises. And then additionally, I believe we might want to consider soft tissue mobilization as well. Here is the 2008 version, again where we have what symptoms might be unilateral neck pain. They present with limited motion. Symptom onset is often linked to a recent uh, awkward or, un or unguarded movement. This is that person who turned their head funny and all of a sudden their neck is locked up. And notice here a difference is that associated or referred upper extremity pain may actually be present. Impairments are limited range of motion. Neck pain reproduced with range of motion, particularly at end ranges. We'll see restrictions in cervical and thoracic segmental mobility. And neck and neck related upper arm pain may be produced with uh, provocation testing of these segments. In other words, uh, for example, manual uh, posterior anterior pressures may reproduce the patient's symptoms. Again, interventions would be mobilization manipulation procedures directed at the cervical spine and thoracic spine, stretching exercises, and then oftentimes we'll follow up with coordination, strengthening, and endurance exercises for these patients. So we see we now have a little bit wider uh, intervention model proposed. Moving on to the centralization classification. Initially, this was your exam. This was considered the uh, neck and arm pain or cervical radiculopathy classification, where we have examination findings uh, look that find radicular or referred symptoms in the arm, centralization or peripheralization with cervical active range of motion testing, sort of a la the McKenzie method. Signs of nerve root compression, such as a positive Sperling's test, changes in myotomal strength, reflex changes. Um, they come in with a diagnosis of cervical radiculopathy. Thank you very much. And also added here was they might present with a positive upper limb neurodynamic test. Interventions recommended at that time were traction and repeated movements to centralize symptoms again a la McKenzie. Additional things to consider would be again cervical or thoracic mobilization and manipulation, neuromobilization techniques, and particularly incorporating deep neck flexor strengthening. Again directly from the 2008 guidelines, 
their signs and symptoms might be neck pain with associated radiating pain, either that typical narrow band of lancinating pain or more diffuse symptoms. They may also express, uh, present with paresthesias, numbness, and weakness. Their pain may be produced with uh, a Sperling's test, upper limb neurodynamic testing, neck and arm related pain may be relieved with cervical distraction, and they may again have those signs of nerve root compression such as upper extremity sensory strength or reflex deficits. Notice here the recommended uh, treatments have changed a little bit. We now have upper quarter and neural, neuro, neural mobilization procedures, we have traction, and we have thoracic mobilization and manipulation. Notice here how the repeated motions uh, to centralize symptoms have disappeared. Essentially, uh, what this means is that there is better evidence for uh, sort of that repeated motion a la McKenzie approach for lumbar conditions uh, than there is for cervical conditions. Essentially, these guys are calling this sort of the neck and arm pain classification, and we now provide them a package of treatment. The old conditioning and increased exercise tolerance. Generally, these are individuals with lower pain and disability ratings than, for example, the uh, mobility or radiculopathy category. Um, they generally have more chronic symptoms. They will generally not have signs of nerve root compression or centralization or peripheralization. They may present with segmental hypermobility and will oftentimes present with poor, poor strength and endurance of the deep neck flexors and scapular stabilizers. Essentially the idea with treatment is improve strength and endurance of the neck and upper quarter, some general aerobic conditioning. Uh, I would add here to focus on deep neck flexor strengthening and adequate postural control. So if we look at how this progressed, again their typical signs and symptoms are going to be neck pain. And here they do describe with possible referred upper extremity symptoms, uh, these Conditions may oftentimes be linked to some be linked to some sort of preceding trauma, specifically whiplash, and these are oftentimes again individuals with chronic symptoms. As far as physical impairments, you will see strength, endurance, and coordination deficits. Notice here the addition of coordination as a focus. Neck pain with mid-range motion that worsens with end range. In other words, it just doesn't hurt at the end range, it hurts in the middle. Neck and upper extremity symptoms may be pr produced with provocation of the involved segments. Cervical instability present. And here they note specifically that muscle spasming adjacent to the involved segments may prohibit accurate testing. We'll talk about this more in the examination process, but sometimes these patients uh, are presenting with so much muscle guarding to uh, protect a hyper hypermobile segment. Recommended interventions for this group are coordination, strengthening, and endurance exercises, a lot of patient education and counseling, and they do discuss stretching exercises. Um, but these would not be aggressive stretches, these would be uh, stretching to uh, address the compensatory tightness that has developed. Reduce headache classification. Again, in 2004, this was originally described as unilateral headaches preceded by neck pain. They may have headaches triggered by neck movement or position elicited by examination of the neck. In other words, you can reproduce their symptoms in the clinic. 
we may particularly see dysfunction of the upper cervical segments, typically from anywhere from the occiput to approximately C4. Other things to consider would be trigger points in the upper quarter musculature. Interventions would be cervical mobilization and manipulation, strengthening of the neck and upper quarter, postural education. Additionally, we may also want to consider soft tissue mobilization or trigger point techniques and also relaxation. In other words, managing stress. The updated concepts regarding uh, neck pain with headaches. Again, we're looking at oftentimes unilateral neck pain and associated headaches. Oftentimes the headache is preceded by or aggravated by neck movements or sustained positions. We'll see both times that they've emphasized this concept of unilateral headaches. However, I will argue that the patient may have a bilateral unilateral problem. In other words, they could have headache on both sides and they basically have the same problem bilaterally. Their headache is oftentimes uh, provoked um, by testing of the upper cervical segments. They oftentimes would present with limited cervical range of motion, specifically restri upper cervical restriction. We will be looking uh, in the cervical examination process at the uh, cervical flexion rotation test. And they will oftentimes concurrently demonstrate strength and endurance deficits, particularly of the deep stabilizing muscles of the neck. Again, interventions are cervical mobilization or manipulation, flexibility exercises, and then again, the strengthening coordination and endurance exercises. Pain control classification. This is essentially that patient who comes in and they just hurt, period. Oftentimes their examination is such that you can't really do much with them uh, because their pain and disability levels are so high. And so how do we get this person to move forward, hopefully into other classifications? Oftentimes it's very recent onset. Usually this is the acute uh, whiplash patient. They may have symptoms referred into the upper quarter, sometimes even into the lower quarter. Uh, they oftentimes can't tolerate anything. This is the person, if you look at them funny, they start hurting more. Uh, there is evidence that these uh, individuals are oftentimes going to be sensitive to any sort of neurodynamic testing. This would include upper quarter neurodynamic testing as well as things possibly like a slump test. Interventions, essentially get them to start moving gently. So gentle active range of motion within their pain tolerance. Move other stuff. Okay, so, move, so range of motion of adjacent regions. Physical modalities as needed. TENS, heat, ice. Activity modification to control their pain. Possibly I would recommend here contacting their physician regarding appropriate meds or other interventions. Um, and again, there's been some emerging evidence looking particularly at education regarding pain mechanisms to decrease their fear um, so that they're more confident that they can move safely. So the big question is, does this model actually improve outcomes? So in 2007, Julie Fritz and Gerard Brennan presented a retrospective cohort study looking at 274 patients that were treated in the Intermountain Health System, uh, which is a, a wide-ranging uh, health system uh, in Utah. Treatment was provided at the discretion of the physical therapist, and then the researchers retrospectively looked at patient charts, classified the patients as receiving uh, appropriate interventions uh, for the classification or inappropriate interventions, and then looked at where their difference between those groups of patients. Here is sort of the algorithm 
that they used with the five classifications, pain control, exercise and conditioning, mobility, headache, and centralization. Notice how this chart just looks a whole lot easier than that algorithm from the Wong study. Here are the characteristics between the patients receiving match treatments versus those not receiving match treatments. They had similar age in their mid-40s. 70% of these individuals were women. They had similar onset uh, uh, in duration of symptoms. They, they started with similar uh, disability and pain ratings. However, following treatment, uh, now they start to look different. Uh, individuals who received match treatments had much greater improvements in the neck disability and pain rating scales, and a much higher percentage of individuals who received match treatments uh, achieved the uh, minimal detectable change on the neck disability index. So we will be further reviewing these principles from the treatment-based classification as we go through uh, the examination process during the live class. I encourage you to review the articles assigned regarding treatment-based classification. And uh, if you have, as I said, if you have any questions, we'll be sure to address those in the live course. Uh, so here ends the recorded modules, and from here we'll be off and running in the live course. I thank you very much.